Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, where we talk about today's issues, trends and news from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by Dr. David Bob from Hillsdale, and we're going to be talking about whether or not America has become a post-constitutional country at this time. So David, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Chris. I know it's a long walk from Washington, D.C., so we appreciate you making the trek. <laughs> well, there's... Uh... Uh, a lot of reasons why I'm happy to be here, but uh, 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 this occasion to talk about this important topic is, is right at the top of the list. So before we get into that, just out of curiosity, what would make someone whose hair hasn't grayed yet and mm. that kind of thing even want to pursue the study of, let alone the lecturing on constitutional types of topics? I grew up in the, uh, the great state of Minnesota, and uh, over dinner table conversations, my parents always engaged uh, uh, us in, in a conversation about the day's events. And I had uh, a really wonderful teacher uh, in, in middle school and then throughout high school who, who challenged me to think about uh, uh, taking ideas and, and uh, thinking about how they could come into political action. So I got involved in some some campaigns and and uh, went off to college and was involved in in uh, uh, the study of political science and just realized that I wanted to continue to pursue that in in, in graduate school. I think that uh, unfortunately there is a lot of apathy amongst young people when it comes to things political and and it's uh, one of my desires to reverse that trend. Well, and also, you know, as we talked a little bit before the show, unfortunately people don't understand what's in the Constitution. They don't understand what's in the Declaration. They have the hearsay, the myths, and those kinds of things, but no real understanding of the fact that it's there not to hinder them as individuals, or as has been quoted by the President of saying that it, it doesn't say, it says, it's a document of negative liberties. It says mm -hmm. what the government can't do. It doesn't say what it must do for you. People think that it, it's a barrier to their happiness if they haven't taken the time to read it or understand it, or understand some of its histories, or the things that are behind it. Um, how would you bring that back into the the light for them to help well, them understand I think, it? You know, it is awfully uh, an easy thing to do, amazingly enough, to sit down and read the United States Constitution. Some of the language is a little bit archaic, but when you think of, uh, for example, uh, the Constitution of the European Union. It runs to uh, scores and scores of pages. Uh, even the state of Alabama's Constitution is 300,000 words. Our federal Constitution is a fraction of that at about 5,000. It takes about 25, 30 minutes to read it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, uh, I have a, a friend who teaches in the Ann Arbor Public Schools that he does with his students, which I think every American ought to do at some point in his or her life, is read the Constitution in a way with real attention to every clause and every part of it. What he does in his class is on Constitution Day, uh, the date that we commemorate the signing of the Constitution, that happened in September 17th, 1787, uh, he asks his uh, students to one after the other rise and, and read a portion of the Constitution. And then after they've gone through the whole thing, it takes about half, uh, half an hour as I said, they have a party and they celebrate the liberties that come from that thing. Now, a lot of Americans, I think, think that our rights come from the government, and the Constitution stands four square against that idea. Right. It outlines the rights that we have, but it's the Declaration of Independence that tells us where our rights come from, and they come for our cre from our Creator. Right, which is probably one of the reasons that you find government often attacking the concept of there being a supreme being, a Creator, because it's in complete conflict with their desire to run things in that big government kind of fashion that we've tended toward in, in recent decades. Well, one of the interesting things I, I, I think along those lines is that there is a limiting factor already if you, if you admit that you're a created being. And for all of the leading lights of the American founding, that was a very good point of departure. If we, as individuals and also as a society, are not just here on our own accord, but because of uh, what the Declaration calls divine providence, well, it gives you a reminder. It reminds you that, that uh, some measure of, of, of humility might be called for. You know, the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was uh, put forward in 1948, that's the thing that largely uh, constitutions around the globe now are patterned after. It has a long laundry list of different rights that, that people have. 
And one of the things that that document, which has really been uh, uh, extremely influential over the course of the, the last 60 years, it doesn't note where the rights come from. Right. One of the people that was involved in the creation of that document was asked, well, why not? And he said, if we tried to uh, figure that thing out with all of the gathering of people from all over the globe, Jacques Maritain said, if we had tried to figure that thing out, the meeting and the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, presentation of this document would have fallen apart. But that is a central thing to get right. Where do our rights come from? And the fact that we, uh, we don't do that today, that we don't know the answer to that question today is very troubling. Right. And so, and the, the, the other part of it is there's a lot of myth around what's in the documents. Um, talk to me a little bit about some of the common myths that you come across as you're lecturing or others where people stand up and say, wait, David, mm -hmm. that's not correct because there's a separation of church and state. It's constitutional. Mm -hmm. what, what, where do you see some of the biggest disconnects between the reality right. of what's written versus people's perceptions? I think you're right. Uh, one would have uh, a long list of, of the, the myths and, and misconceptions. Among them is one that you, that you mentioned, the, the, the separation of church and state. There's a lot of confusion about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the separation of church and state is something that I think was a, was a really remarkable development of the American founding. Mm -hmm. It properly understood. Uh, the, the church is not the state, and the state is not the church. And the insight that James Madison especially and Thomas Jefferson had in the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia in trying to take down the establishment of the Anglican Church in that state was that people do not depend upon particular religious views for their rights. And therefore, they shouldn't be taxed to support one particular church that may or may not be that church of their choosing. And what they set in motion in challenging that status quo was, I think, a real, uh, uh, a tremendous leap forward it, it, it marked uh, a great expansion of liberty because what they were saying is, why would you want to tie the fate of your religious uh, uh, beliefs to political whim? Right. Wouldn't it do damage to, uh, to religion as well as to government? So there is a, a separation of church and state institutionally, but what it, hasn't come, what it has come to mean, I think, is problematic, and that is that that separation many people think, means that religion over here and politics over here have nothing to do one with the other. And which is completely incorrect. And I would argue that we need more people of religious belief of some sort in government, at least to reinstill that place of humility <laughs> in their hearts and minds and to understand that they aren't the biggest deal on the planet. I think that's absolutely right. One of the things that uh, uh, Jefferson and Madison shared in common with all of their, uh, their, their fellow uh, patriots was the idea that, that if we are to have a Republican small r, a representative form of government, that we're going to have to have a certain amount of civic virtue, mm -hmm. a virtue that will sustain that represent, representative form of government. And the best way to sustain virtue is to have a moral conviction that is rooted in religious belief. And again, their emphasis was not that everybody has to be a particular denomination, that you have to be Catholic or Presbyterian or Anglican or any one thing in order to be a good citizen. The idea was rather that if we're going to be united as one people, that we should be united around a common set of ideas that are sustained by a common virtue. Right, right. And so, but we've moved to a different place in society where moral conviction or having a moral compass is often frowned upon and especially in the political arena people are dismissive of the fact that someone's crooked or they operate in a cronyistic fashion they say well you know they they have to do that they're a politician so we'll give them a pass do you think that that's contributed to to this movement away from the constitution or toward a place of virtue oh absolutely i i think that uh Right now, the cynicism that runs rampant in this country about politics uh, is, is overwhelming. It's not for nothing that Jon Stewart has the best-selling textbook about uh, American government uh, and that he uh, continues to enjoy a real popularity by making fun of crooked politicians and sort of uh, 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 emphasizing the, the idea that, that they're all crooked. It hasn't always been such. And in fact, uh, it wasn't that long ago that we uh, expected our politicians to actually behave and comport themselves like statesmen and stateswomen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that a recovery of that, seeking a recovery of that, 
uh, is an important task for all Americans. You know, you pointed to um, uh, some of the myths that, that, that surround the Constitution. I think one of the big myths that, that per, uh, uh, prevails today is that the Constitution is a living document. Mm -hmm. There's only one sense in which that's true. And I would argue that in their wisdom, the founders said that the Constitution of the United States can be amendable. Yes. It's hard. Only 27 of them, of some more than 5,000 that have been proposed over the, over the centuries, uh, have, have come into fruition. So it's really hard to do. By design. By design. But nonetheless, it can be changed. Now, the prevailing idea is that it just has to change with the generations. And that, so what one generation might believe about in things that should be enduring can be changed upon a kind of whimsy. Right. And I think that's been a, a, a really uh, uh, negative uh, uh, trend. Right. Well, if, if we don't have something, a foundation that we're basing our laws upon, and whim is our factor, if you look at, I, I know people get nervous when you start using uh, names like Hitler, but technically what he did during his time was legal to exterminate large populations um, because they were lesser humans or what have you, but if the society just decided that, okay, this person or this group of people is of less value in today's time, there's nothing to protect them. And that was one of the interesting things about our Constitution, is it protected everyone. It was supposed to protect everyone and apply even application of the law to everyone. It hasn't always worked that way. And the more we begin to interpret it or treat it as a living document, it seems to continue to slip. Well, I think that's true. You know, when, when uh, Martin Luther King... Uh, reflected back on the American founding, he said that, that uh, uh, establishing that standard of equality uh, was of absolutely vital importance. And initially, when trying to cash that check, it came back marked insufficient funds. Right. But the bank of justice was not bankrupt. Right. So the view that we take oftentimes today is that the founding was, in fact, bankrupt and that we had to move beyond that. I mean, that's the essence of what progressives argue, that you got to get beyond the Declaration, you got to get beyond the Constitution, and you have to launch into this kind of brave new world of a living constitutionalism. The problem is that, the, that you then are faced with, with a real dilemma. What limits power? The American founders tried to figure out a system that limited everybody. Right. And that, as you rightfully note, establishes equality and liberty for all. Right. When you set that standard, now it's going to take a while uh, in our history to achieve that, right. but think of what a revolutionary thing it was to establish that even as the standard. As opposed to being born into a class and a destiny that you had no control over, you just happened to be lucky by birth, you get a benefit, otherwise you're born into poverty, sorry, you're stuck. Think of it this way, you know, one, when Madison and Jefferson were, were trying to figure out how they could bring religious liberty to their state, they were also looking at a law that was still on the books that said that the firstborn son would inherit everything upon the, uh, the, the death of his parents. That was the law. And they said, that doesn't make sense. That's not, that's not just. That doesn't create the kind of uh, justice that we want in our society. So there were a whole host of things that we had within our tradition that we had to sort out and say, this is a bad part of our tradition, and this is a good part. Mm -hmm. Let's retain the good things. And the standard that you use is, does it, is it, is it uh, consistent with the laws of nature and of nature's God? Mm -hmm. And when you erect that as your standard, uh, you get some really uh, uh, amazing uh, answers. Right. And so talk to me a little bit, though, about we have the topic of, are we in a post-constitutional age? What symptoms do you see in the way that society or the country is running itself that begin to give you pause and concern that we may be heading in a very bad direction? Yes, I, I think uh, uh, if you look at the way that Washington runs today uh, and, and particularly what attention it pays to the Constitution, it becomes almost like what Madison called a parchment barrier. That is that it's a piece of paper largely forgotten, uh, largely left behind, a kind of after, after, afterthought mm -hmm. in any one of the debates. Uh, think of the way, for example, that, that uh, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg responded to a question uh, <laughs> when, when posed uh, 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 this query. Would you recommend to the Egyptian people the United States Constitution as they contemplate forming a new one? She said, I would not. I would rather look to the South African or the Canadian. Now, you, you pointed also uh, earlier to the kind of uh, 
rule of law that can be there in form, but not in reality. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Constitution was terrific. If you look at just the letters on that uh, piece of paper, it seemed like all the people of, of the Soviet Union enjoyed great liberty. But of course, in reality, they didn't. That was a worthless document. If we make our Constitution just an afterthought in our debates, it's irrelevant. So I don't think we're yet in a post-constitutional state as a people. But the political elite oftentimes treat the Constitution as if it's irrelevant. Well, and when you've got people that are supposed to be the top cop, quote unquote, saying that they don't believe that we have a Constitution worth copying in other places around the world, it should give you concern that they may be helping to readjust the meaning uh, of the Constitution or interpreting different portions of it to mean things that are more suited to their ideological perspective versus enforcing the law and protecting the people equally. That's right. The, the, the job of our uh, legal and judicial system, the job of every elected member of Congress and every elected uh, member of state legislatures, is to try to achieve uh, justice under the law. It's not just their conception of justice, whatever they think that is. It is rather that we have taken the time uh, to carefully uh, uh, set out what it is that liberty and equality entail. And I think that kind of uh, thinking that we saw in that answer from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm -hmm. is really the prevailing view in a lot of our uh, uh, legal and, and uh, uh, political uh, 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 sort of academic institutions today. She just had the, uh, the, the, the kind of guts to uh, say what a lot of others don't. Right. Well, if you look at also uh, the recent Obamacare decision and the fact that the Constitution was, or that the law was reinterpreted in order to support mm. uh, the president's view or the Congress's view as opposed to the judicial system working as a counterbalance to make sure that it was supposed to be the brakes, the emergency brakes, in case things get out of hand in the other two branches. Mm -hmm. And here they are trying to figure out how to justify and support the argument of the others, which is not the way that the system was designed to work, at least not in my estimation. That's right. You know, there's, a, there's an odd thing at work, I think, today that of our three co-equal branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judicial, each one of them is had a very difficult time kind of staying within their lane, if you might uh, uh, think of it that way. Yes. They're trying to do the job of the other branches, and in so doing, they get all confused. So, for example, in the original design of the Constitution, the idea was that the judicial branch would be the weakest one. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, we know now today, the court wields immense power. Sure. A lot of that has been given to the court, though, by the legislative branch. Think yes. of it from a member of Congress's perspective. If you can uh, get up and, and, and plead that, well, the courts will sort it out, or the executive bureaucracy will figure it out, then it gives you a kind of plausible deniability. Yes. Right? So if there's, let's say, a, a dispute over uh, uh, the EPA, for example, a member of Congress can say, well, we wrote the law. We wrote it really clearly. What you need to do is go talk to the bureaucrats that are enforcing the law over at the EPA. The EPA, in turn, is going to say to uh, a landowner, let's say, that's locked in a dispute, oh, no, 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 it was a, a confused law. We're just trying to follow what, what Congress told us to do. You have to go talk to your member of Congress. Right. Well, what ends up happening is that citizens end up getting the runaround. Sure. And that nobody right now, no one, the branches of government, no uh, uh, one of the three, is really having that kind of accountability that I think we as, uh, we the people, ought to be demanding of them. That accountability to the Constitution. Well, and, and we're watching them cede their accountability to other branches or to the bureaucracy, as you're saying. The laws are written very ambiguously uh, to leave to interpretation to the, the courts or to the, the uh, branch of the bureaucracy that's going to be enforcing the law. If you look at, for example, Obamacare, 2,700 pages worth of information when it comes out, very vague, sometimes conflicting. Now another 20,000 pages has been generated. People have no idea what law is in place, and that doesn't get into the tax code and everything else. And so what's the solution? How do we bring it back from this kind of wild, wild west scenario to something more manageable, something where accountability is reinstalled? Is there a solution? 
I think there is, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be quick. But one of the things that uh, uh, we at Hillsdale College focus on as an institution of, of uh, uh, higher learning is, is education, obviously. And mm -hmm. while that's not going to be a silver bullet for all of our problems, in fact, uh, many of them are going to have to be uh, redressed through uh, clear and uh, decisive acts of statesmanship. But when students have no sense of what uh, it is that is missing today and what in fact has been inserted in its place when it comes to civic knowledge, we're in a real bind. So we have to start with young people, I think, but we're also working uh, at the college to, to influence those who are, who are in Congress and to educate them about the way that the Constitution was set up and how its uh, arrangements of power uh, have been deformed. Uh, uh, Take one case in uh, uh, point. You noted Obamacare. There's also this uh, bill that was uh, uh, made law in 2010, Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is another big one. Dodd-Frank now, here we are three years later, only a third of it has come into effect. The rest is still being negotiated in that process you spoke of where they write very little and push the, the responsibility over to the, the, the huge, uh, unaccountable bureaucracies. Yes. So it really is a matter now of asking members of Congress and their senior staff. We have a program that we uh, uh, have now 150 senior staffers, chiefs of staff and others on the Hill enrolled in, where they become Madison fellows and study the idea that the Constitution really ought to be at the heart of our inquiry. We have 600,000 people or so that have signed up for our online courses on the Constitution. And so uh, we're confident that there, there, there are many things afoot. We see them in, in uh, uh, some very exciting things that are happening in charter schools and other areas in American life where people are awakening to the fact that if they don't get active, then things are going to be decided for them. Yes, and many people are waking up, as, uh, as said in many grassroots circles, uh, on a daily basis. And so if they are starting to wake up and they're looking for information, how can they find out more about Hillsdale and the programs that you're working on there? Well, we'd uh, love to in invite them to, uh, to join us uh, for whether the online courses or our programs that are webcast. Uh, the best way for them to find out about the college is to go to hillsdale.edu. I should also note that Hillsdale publishes monthly uh, a, a, a publication called Imprimus. Uh, it goes out to uh, uh, nearly three million people now, and it's uh, a speech digest and gives somebody, uh, uh, an individual who's interested in ideas, something, uh, some food for thought each month, and that's available free of charge if you go to the website again, hillsdale.edu. Well, thank you for sharing that component of the interview with us, and now people, I'm sure, will be checking you out in more detail. If you hold on for just a moment, we need to take a quick break and hear a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. challenge 
to states' rights? You think the founders weren't brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing by carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And in addition to underwriting our show, what the Conservative Forum is best known for is its speaker series. One of the reasons we were blessed in having David Bob attend our show this evening is that he'll be speaking later in the evening at the Conservative Forum about whether or not the United States is in a post-constitutional age. And so definitely plug in for his uh, show if you can or his speech but in coming months uh, for example in May Bill Whittle will be speaking uh, in June uh, Ying Ma author of Chinese Girl in the Ghetto will be speaking July 9th Debbie Bacigalupi will be speaking she's a former congressional candidate has been on this show and uh, will be covering I'm sure things around um, the global uh, battle for property rights. And in August, we have Steve Forbes and Elizabeth Ames, co-authors of the Freedom Manifesto, coming to speak for the Conservative Forum. The forum meets uh, first Tuesday of every month, except for in July. Uh, typically, the, sh the uh, event starts at 7 o'clock. And uh, the meeting place is at the IFES Portuguese Hall in uh, Mountain View at 432 Steerland Road. And in closing, it is important uh, to think about whether or not our constitutional rights are being violated. If you've got things like the property rights battles happening here in the Bay Area, people are losing their liberties on a daily basis, but many of them don't know where those rights come from. They do trust that the government is going to be compassionate in its dealings and uh, dealing out of the law. And if you don't know what the Declaration says, if you don't know what the Constitution says, or what they mean on a more fundamental level, you are at a, a complete disadvantage. And you may not know that you have a leg to stand on. So please do investigate uh, the Hillsdale EDU website and learn more, uh, enlighten yourself, and get active. Thanks again for joining us. Again, I've been your host, Chris Pareja, and this has been The Right Side. Have a great evening.